Hello, viewers. We're back again with another Formula One podcast. Of course, we had the uh, terribly exciting Sochi race this weekend, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> More of that later, no doubt. But we're going to catch up. We didn't have a, a, a podcast for Bahrain a couple of weeks ago. So I'm again joined by Tim Goodchild. Hello, Tim. It's a belated Mahaban and a more recent Drazdoy, Alan. It is indeed. <laughs> Looking forward to our little chat today. So, obviously, catching up with Bahrain then, Tim. We're going we're gonna to crack straight on with the races for these last two races yeah. rather than doing all the other build-up stuff. So, um, moving on to Bahrain, tell me uh, your thoughts on some of the action. It was great. I think, first of all, we had uh, Valtteri Bottas uh, qualifying on pole, taking his maiden pole. Um, and it's been a... A good turn of events, really, for, for Valtteri recently, um, but it was great to see him on pole for the first time in, in Bahrain. The race itself, though, was it was full of action from, from start to finish, really. I mean, the, uh, the Mercedes truly under pressure with the, with the Ferraris coming through the pack. But, uh, you know, we thought would Bottas get a first win in Bahrain, but we found out that he had uh, issues on his on the grid. Though mm. the, the the was it the uh, tire, tire blankets? Yeah, tire, tire blankets not working for him, which was it was very curious. I mean, I mean, overall a, a very curious race. Uh, you know, sometimes I see people really having a go on Twitter. You know, mm. Bottas. Oh, he was rubbish. He wasn't racing very well. You know, the guy's driving the wheels off the car. But if the car isn't working properly, no driver can surmount that. And these days, obviously, they're so technical. You know, if the tyres aren't working, something's wrong. So it's a very strange Grand Prix for him, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and let's not forget he is a good driver. You know, he was signed by the Mercedes team for a reason. Um, but, you know, we we saw sort of great uh, strategy choices from, from the Ferrari team. We've always been a little bit conservative in the past in terms of their strategy choices. But uh, you had the Mercedes um, leading, I think Bottas took an early lead, um, and then you had that sort of switch by uh, Lewis uh, going ahead of, of, of Bottas, who we'll see that he was struggling with uh, with the pace for, on his tyres. And then you had the, the Ferraris come in to make a, a switch onto the softs. Or sort of the super softs, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, oh, what's this? You know, Ferrari we actually taking a, a bit of a gamble here. Um, was it going to work? Now, you did have, then have a, a safety car pretty much straight after that, and Mercedes could have capitalised on that. Then we saw a, should we say, a rather stupid error by uh, Lewis Hamilton, um, starting to slow up. Daniel Ricciardo as they were coming into the pits. Yeah, the a strange positions. incident. Yeah, a strange yeah. incident. He knew he was behind him. Yeah. He was driving in a sort of erratic way. Uh, why didn't he just cruise in and stop behind his teammate? Very strange. You're not going to gain or lose any time. No. Whatever you do, you can't go into the pits until your teammates left the bay anyway. So you're very, very silly. Yeah, right. yeah. A strange... And, a, you know, that that was that proved to be extremely costly, ultimately. Yeah. You know? Um, so, because then for the rest of the race, you had uh, Hamilton having to not only chase down Vettel, mm. who who'd, who was in the lead at that point, but then also get past and get a get a lead almost, you know. So it yeah, was, I uh, mean, it, it, one thing it was a shame, of course, was you had uh, early on you had the uh, brake failure for Max Verstappen. You know, Red Bull having a not great season by their standards. Nothing seems to be working yet. Every you know, We've seen several major updates to the car. We're expecting another one for the Spanish Grand Prix. Uh, and that brake failure came as quite a surprise. It's actually two races now where they've had a brake failure, but we'll get to the other one later. Uh, and I think he you know, he could have ended up in the mix somewhere uh, mm. with, the, with the tyre strategy they had. So it's a bit of a shame for him. You know, great yeah. starts as well from Max. Has to be said, Chinese Grand Prix and Bahrain, you know, he, he was making up places. So... Bit of a shame we lost that sort of sting in the tail of the race, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then looking at other uh, moments in the race, you had Lance Stroll having another difficult race. Disappointing uh, end for him, really. Um, I mean, he really does deserve to have a, a decent race uh, at the start of this campaign. But um, T-boned. Absolutely T-boned and taken out by... Uh, Carlos Sainz, who really should have known better, mm. uh, you know, he was coming out. Of the, Sainz was coming out the pits. Stroll coming fast down on the on the on the straight into the first corner. He was ahead going into mm. the first corner. Yeah. 
where did science think he was going to go? It wasn't, Just even, he... wasn't, wasn't even debatable. It's yeah. quite clear. Uh, and what happens is when you have a new driver uh, like Lance, the other drivers try to bully him. They mm. try to push him off the track and push him off the track. And in a way, you can't, sometimes you've got to go through this and you've got to say, no, I'm going to take my ground. And all the other drivers he's connected with, you know, they'll now gradually, they're ruining their own race quite yeah. often as well. And they'll realise in the future, hey, let's give this guy a bit of space. You know, even if, he, if, if you know, it's, it's like you just want to avoid that kind of incident. For Carlos, it kind of puts a blot on his copybook that was unnecessary yeah. in terms of the race. Uh, and for Lance, it's just a shame because he's just not getting the, the time to finish these races. It has been a tricky start to the season for him. And a, I kind of... You know, he reminds me a bit of what do you remind me of? Uh, he reminds watching him reminds me of an old Jordan driver. Uh, forget it, Ralph. 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 Oh, Ralph Furman. Ralph Furman. That was it. Because whenever I used to watch Ralph Furman racing <laughs> his Jordan, it would be like a rally car. He yeah. would be moving the wheel around, and the car would be moving around. And I think, oh goodness me, every lap would be edge of your seat action. Not quick, I might add, just risky. <laughs> and uh, I kind of sometimes, I you know, it's because. I kind of felt the car was in charge and really, you know, whereas you look at Fernando Alonso, he's in charge of the car, clearly. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's kind of a bit where, where Lance is sort of, you know, he's not fully in control sometimes because he's really working to keep in control of that car. But no, uh, unlucky on that, that corner and you know, a, silly, a silly incident for Carlos. So I'm just trying to figure out what Ralph Furman is doing today. Anyway, um, many years ago now. <laughs> I dig these up, don't I? I just like throw them in there. Why not? Why not? Although didn't he, was he what part of the uh, uh, the United States fiasco? Didn't he end up finishing fourth in the, in the race that only six cars finished? I don't know. It was, it, it was no him and now. Thiago Montero. Yeah, there was. In the bit, Jordan team. You know what? I can't remember now, actually. It was <laughs> such a nightmare race, wasn't it? The two Ferraris yeah. out there and... Ah, oh, goodness. Uh, anyway, me. anyway, yeah. fond memories, huh? Uh, uh, one, yeah, yeah. One point to note is actually is that uh, you know Fernando Alonso, and we'll talk about this. Who doesn't yeah. start Sochi? Uh, that was the last race he didn't make the start on. So he's actually never had a, a non-start since. Oh, really? There you really? go. Yeah. Wow, wow. So, um, but no, I mean Bahrain though. It was it was a fun race really from start to finish. You know, lots of action. It's always a great setting there, um, and, and it's a good twilight race t t to see. And we left there with the, with the championship really sort of poised um, mm. with Hamilton, Vettel at the top. And a lot of people were talking in between Bahrain and Russia saying Mercedes need to get their strategy uh, on, on point. Mm. They should be promoting yeah. like Hamilton to be the number one driver with, with Bottas. You know, taking a number, a clear yeah, number two I, role. I, I cannot I mean, understand and we're that. Only three races in. You know? I know. I cannot understand that. I mean, Sky TV have been pushing this a lot. Well, shouldn't be, shouldn't you know, Valtteri now be, you know, number two driver, and shouldn't Kimi already be the number two driver? And you know, Kimi was ahead of Vettel the other day. I mean, yeah. really, Kimi should be moving over. They're racing drivers. Exactly. You've hired a racing driver. They're racing. Let them race. We've only got two teams that can compete. Let's at least have four drivers competing rather than just two. Absolutely. Makes it a bit more action, doesn't it? Otherwise, we've got two drivers, and whenever they're doing well, they're going to have to pull over. People just don't understand racing. No. No, I, feels, I, I don't want Kimi pulling over. I don't yeah. want Valtteri pulling over. Because they will have good races. They will have wins. Of yeah, we'll look at Kimi. In when was it two two thousand seven? Uh, you know, a few races to go. He was out of it, and suddenly he just gets a few wins and wins it. And you, you're like, yeah. exactly, you know. So, you know, if we were in like round twelve, round thirteen, yeah. and you're starting to see a clear leader in each team, then that's a different conversation. But after three races, come on, you know, and you only need like as Alan's just said, you only need Kimmy to win a race. And all of a sudden, he can be right back into it now, you know. That's right. I mean, he's, he's not exactly that far behind in, in, in the standings as it no, is. It's, it's one of those situations where when you pass Monza, then you start looking on the last sort of quarter of races and you say, right, what's the balance in terms of where we are? But in terms of this part of the season, up until the season break, I always say fair game, mm. you know, let's see where you are. 
and then when you come back after a season break you have a couple of races and then again you you assess it so i i hope nobody brings in team orders no. uh you know but it was as i say it was uh, Vettel again uh, you know good win for him you yeah. know he's very strong very confident in that ferrari you can tell it really works for him this year so far lewis has looked very strong as well and you know it's it's going to be interesting to see how you know everything progresses uh, this year with those guys but Valtteri, you know, was very strong throughout the weekend, but when it came to the race, um, he uh, he just, like you say, those tyre problems came in and he just wasn't able to do anything with it. Yeah. I think there's also an honourable mention, though, for Bahrain, uh, for Felipe Massa, uh, finishing in, in sixth place in, in the Williams. Um, another great result, another strong performance by Felipe, uh, who seems to be slightly re-energized, re-energized this year uh, following perhaps a stronger uh, perform driving in, in Valtteri Bottas leaving the team, him becoming in as being the now the de facto number one driver, really, against uh, a rookie who's struggling anyway mm. in Lance Stroll. Um, perhaps we'll see a much more a, a more refined drive in, in, well, in uh, do, Felipe Well, you know, the problem is we say that, don't we? We say, look at, we look at Felipe. He's, he's got six, seventh, eighth, and so on. You say, oh, it's really good. And his teammates down in 16th, 17th, whatever. But then you think, well, what would Valtteri have been doing? Would mm-hmm. he have been doing fifth or sixth or fifth or sixth or better? Maybe. We never really know because we can only rate him by his yeah. teammate. But it shows, I mean, is it showing that he's doing really well or Lance is doing really badly? Mm. Well, mm. we just don't know, do we? So it's really impossible to say. But at the moment, you know when a new driver comes into Formula 1 and you go, wow, that's dynamite. I just haven't said that with Lance yet, unfortunately. No. But we wait and see. We wait and see. Okay, so that was Bahrain. Um, and then on to, on to Russia. Yeah. So, which was, you could probably sum up Russia in about, oh, 20 seconds, Alan. Exactly. They started <laughs> and they finished. <laughs> It was yes. one. Of, I mean, actually, you know, Sochi is one of those sort of race tracks that it's never really had much in the way of racing. The only overtaking opportunity is into turn one. Mm. Uh, it's it's actually fun enough to actually play on the game, yeah. but uh, and I'm sure it's fun for the drivers to drive. But there's not much there. There's no undulation. It's just a flat surface. There's no camber for the most part. Uh, there's a couple of little dips and bits towards the end of the third sector, but it's there's not much else there, and. Yeah, I think it was a, a race weekend where the Ferraris, again, were very quick in practice, looked very quick on their long runs. Um, and, of course, Vettel uh, was looking very quick. Uh, and, of course, then both Ferraris were very quick uh, in terms of the the overall pace and the build-up to the race. But, uh, you know, Lewis uh, all weekend looked a bit off. Uh, he didn't look as quick as his teammate. Uh, and I don't really know what, quite what was going on there with Lewis, really. Very strange weekend for him. No, and uh, you know, even reading reports since he's he just didn't wasn't on it. He just didn't get the setup right, and whilst there was overheating early on in in, in the race, he just didn't feel particularly comfortable. Um, you know, and I and I immediately think, well, if Bottas struggled in in Bahrain, and people were saying, oh, perhaps Hamilton should be the de facto number one. Now that Hamilton struggled in Russia, does that mean that Bottas needs to be the number one driver now? You know, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it's just interesting to see yeah. how things happen yeah, race exactly, to race. Exactly, exactly. I mean, people, and as I say, it's taking back to the point of people who slate drivers just because they're having a bad race. Oh, he's driving rubbish. No idea that there might be problems on the car or what the driver's dealing with. Uh, but either way, uh, you know, getting onto the race, I mean, that, that run down to turn one, was was fantastic yeah. you know for, for, for Valtteri and you know getting the getting the getting the lead and holding it from there he was very strong on the day uh, and it was um but other than that, it, there really like you say there wasn't any overtaking to speak of there wasn't much in the way of tactics in no. terms of tires uh, and I think it's one of those races that the tires were just too durable mm. you know I think there was when you've got two or three pit stops and you've got a lot more in the way of you know, tyre degradation, you, 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 there's more strategy there. Are you going to hang in there? But I mean, I think they even know. said right at the beginning of the race, you had a really early safety car. Um, well, it was on the first lap, wasn't it? You know, um, the, the uh, uh, Grosjean and took basically, well, did they did he take out Jolien Palmer? It's, it's up for debate and it's been de- deemed a racing incident. But so you had a safety car and you had a couple of 
drives go straight into the pits and switch onto the uh, uh, ultra softs. And Wundle said, "Well, that tire will last until the end of the race." Yeah, it's a real you know. shame. I mean, that the the tires there. I just want to break in, obviously, to, at the beginning of the race there because we had a couple of other things just happen at the beginning. Of course, we had the the McLaren of Fernando Alonso yeah. breaking down, which was tragic to see. So sad to see his incredible talent wasted. And, you know, sometimes I quite enjoy watching Fernando sort of in the middle of the pack sometimes because you see him, you know, dragging it to 10th place and really battling every lap. And, of course, here you can see, you know, the car couldn't even make it back. And, you know, here we are the third year now of running these Honda engines and McLaren's just going backwards with his Honda. It's, I mean, they're not moving forwards at all. And, and we have to hope that the next... The next upgrade due around Silverstone is going to make all the difference. But in the meantime, it's painful, isn't no, it? I genuinely think McLaren should say, look, go to America. Go and race in IndyCar for a couple of races. And as well as the Indianapolis 500, go and hone your race craft still, but in a, in a competitive series. Mm. Come back at Silverstone, by which time the car will be better. You know, or at least something to yeah. get you to the end of the race and you can actually deliver on points. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's an appalling situation for them at the moment. I mean, you know, we already saw uh there's a penalty for Stoffel uh at the beginning. Yeah. Uh and we can already if you go back last year, I think it was when Jensen, I think it was a spa or something, had like a forty two grace place grid penalty yeah. or some nonsense like that uh, and I think we're going to see more of that later this year I think we're going to mm. see so many grid penalties down. Yeah. I mean even if they can fix the engine this year and let's just say they do uh, they'll be starting from the back of the grid for every single race anyway yeah. qualifying will be pointless after that yeah. so th it's not and like they've, they can... and they've taken out the rule where you can't stockpile engines on one weekend anymore like like Hamilton did at mm. Spa mm. where he took like Two in two or three engines to see him out to the end of the season, yeah. Um, but you can't do that anymore, they've taken that rule away, so yeah. Honda are basically screwed, <laughs> yeah. It's it's, it's going to be an absolute nightmare for them. The um, the, so the start, I mean, pretty much everyone made it through apart from a couple of guys there. We had Roman Grosjean and Jolien Palmer. Now, firstly, a word on Jolien Palmer, GP2 winner, you know, solid driver. Yeah. He's not just a pay driver, he's a solid driver. And he's just not had the opportunity. I mean, he made a mistake pushing hard in Australia, but he's had a, a few offs and you know, things are, you know, just haven't been able to get it together. And, you know, here he is going into turn one, Roman Grosjean going up on the inside. There's nowhere to go on the inside. Right. That was an absolute beginner error. Oh, I'm going old. up on the inside. He should avoid me. It's the start, mate. There's there's yeah. 20 cars going into that corner. Where do you expect him to go? Mm -hmm. And it, there was no thought. And, you know, he would have easily overtaken him, I feel, in a few yeah. laps. But, unfortunately, it was one of those things And uh, for both of them going home again. And I, I think for Roman, it, it was... It was a, you know, it was an old school, you know, yeah. old school crash for him. You know, he used to do that stuff a lot in the past. Mm -hmm. he, he'd get frustrated and he'd see red and he'd just go for it. I mean, we always look at the massive accident at the start of, uh, of awesome. Spa, yeah, yeah with, that he caused. And it was kind of one of those. It was steaming into the first corner and, you know, going up on the inside in a very similar way to the way he did then and causing a, a big accident. A real shame. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you see... Grosjean in, in, in qualifying, he was about one one point two seconds behind Magnussen on pace, and I think that just sheer frustration going into the race, he wanted to make up lost time maybe, um, and it said it was the perhaps he was thinking more with his his heart than his head going into that first corner, and Jolion got in the way. So, likewise, you know, with, as as Aaron said, you know, uh, as a as a Brit, you know, I will always support the the local drivers, uh, and Jolion did really well to get into or to stay within the team into 2017 to get another season. I do believe he can be a decent driver, and he can mm. deliver deliver the goods, and having. Hulkenberg is a great benchmark for him, but he needs to deliver pretty quickly. Yeah. Otherwise, he could look pretty second rate by mid-season. Well, you know, he, the race is ticked by. I mean, I always say that, you, you, in a way, you do have about half the season to shine, and he needs just a really good weekend. But mm. things are not looking good for him right now. I mean, you know, part of it is also down to the fact that, you know, he didn't have much 
time. We, no. we should point out he had about four laps yeah. in terms of practice to set his car up. He did push his car too hard and crashed in quali, which put him in that position in the first place. So sometimes you do make your own luck to an extent. Mm. But either way, there's nothing he could have done about that. Ultimately, you know, it's just a combination of things where you think, yes, but you crashed into the wall on 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 the qualifying day and that needn't have happened because if you hadn't have done that, you'd just gone a bit slower, you'd still have been higher in the qual- in qualifying than you actually were. So putting himself under pressure. So back onto the race and obviously everybody making it through the first few corners. We had a bit more action happening. We had Daniel Ricciardo, uh, whose brakes set on fire, yeah. uh, on only lap five. Yeah. Very unusual. Now, you know, you think perhaps somehow they overheated behind the safety car or something like that, but it's very unusual for for brakes to overheat like they looked you know, pretty destroyed as well i think it might be purely down to the cooling because mm. even even lewis mm. had uh, issues and there was one shot when he went into the pits to change his tires and there was a there was almost a flame that's right came out from his uh, left front mm. so and they were sort of saying you know he was having overheating issues and they said on commentary that it's only on open air that's uh, the cars are being able to run well. That's why Bottas was having such a good time. So right. perhaps you know, with with whilst the tyres didn't have any degradation issues, it was more the cooling issues within within the front front of the car was having issues, and perhaps could have been a, a factor. Yeah, I mean, Ricciardo. second race in a row that, uh, that, yeah, that Red Bulls had a brake failure. So they, there's certainly something there in terms of you know the the. The airflow that they get all deriving from their brakes uh, isn't working for them. But um, onto the race, Tim. Uh, what, what, what other action? I don't think we really had much action really in this race. It was mainly cars going round and round. It was Vettel <laughs> following. It was Kimi not knowing who was leading and just, you know, uh, just minding. I, I mean, that shows how like disinterested Kimi was in the race. Really. Yes. He thought Lewis was leading <laughs> uh, and, and didn't know what was going on. Uh, and, and what were your other highlights, <laughs> struggling to say much at this point uh i think you know for, for me i think what, what's really great to see not just at this race but all races this season are the force indias i mean mm. whilst we're not really sort of seeing much of them on tv might be a little bit of politics involved there yeah possibly uh but you've got perez and um esteban ocon who are putting in re- points finishing results at I think every Grand Prix this season uh, and yeah. you know they sit wonderfully in, in fourth place in the Constructors Championship on 31 points you know nearly doubled the number of points of, of Williams they're doing really well and I think that, that going into the season they thought that they had not fully developed the car mm-hmm. so they weren't expecting to have regular points finishes so perhaps they are Keeping true to their name and punching above their weight and well, being a good, strong you know, team. It's, on the it's been budget. solid results for Force India this year. Solid results last year. Solid results this year. They've got two decent drivers. Now, again, if you look at Williams, they've got one driver getting all the points yeah, and one driver not. Uh, and would that situation be different if they had two skillful drivers in the car? Williams have always done that, though. It's like that, you know, when they brought Pastor Maldonado in, everybody said, "Look, you know, Pastor's a crasher." You know, he's not going to get the points for you, and he wasn't. He, you know, and even if he did bring money into the team, the amount of damage he was inflicting on the car, they were probably losing half that money in parts. I think there's no doubt that Williams would, should... There's no doubt that Williams should be the next team yeah. in, in that list and that they're not turning their speed into results. Uh, disappointing for Williams. But either way, Force India, cracking job from them. And apparently they've got quite significant upgrades coming in the coming races. I believe it's practically a new car they've got coming. So uh, there's we, we've not seen the best of them yet. But not much, strangely, uh, not much TV... Uh, footage of the the Force India at all. They've, they've they've certainly been left out, but interesting to see how they've performed. Uh, just talking of Williams, of course, you know, again we saw another spin from Lance Stroll again. Uh, oh, he yeah, was knocked by, by uh, uh, Nico Hulkenberg. Apparently, uh, I think I believe he got a penalty as well. Again, that was very unusual. We didn't it looked actually... more like a, a not. He was not by wind. It looked like wind. I never. <laughs> we never actually saw any footage of this supposed knock. And in the replay, yes, it looked like the wind and the curb 
knocked him more than anyone else. He might have been pushed in some way, but the actual incident looked like he just went onto a curb. But anyway, we can't judge it because we haven't seen it. So uh, it is what it is. Uh, Kevin Magnussen again received the penalty as well, which was a shame for him, which knocked him down to 13th place. He was well into, he was into the points, so ninth or 10th somewhere. But he was certainly well in there in terms of the time on track, but obviously following a penalty that ended that for him as well. Shame for him, but a, a bad day for the Haas team, really. Yeah. Not quite what they were looking for uh, in terms of the, the circuit. It's it's funny, isn't it? Like you say, it's a circuit that just doesn't generate much in the way of racing, but it has good politics, doesn't it? And let's know? be honest, we all watch the Western Grand Prix for one thing and one thing only. Vladimir Putin, the most awkward moment of the year yeah. in the cool-down room. I just found it bizarre. You had you know the top three drivers that have just sweated it out on track yet you've got Putin there with his translator and he's talking to them about all the hotels in the area being at capacity I mean that's just what Valtteri Bottas after winning his first Grand Prix <laughs> wants to chat about in front of one of the most powerful and possibly scariest yes. leaders in the world yes the, the hotels are a real problem I'm sure for, for the drivers you know nowhere to stay you know no, it was. Uh, it, it's always a bit awkward. There's always a little bit of silence. I mean, I, I have to admit the cool down room was pretty awkward before he even entered this <laughs> year. Drew, I mean, Drew, just yeah. the three drivers. You know, I don't really know why. I mean, Vettel sort of tried to speak to to uh, Valtteri, but it, it, there wasn't much. They didn't want to seem to speak to each other. I mean, the Finns. Let's face it, the Finns <laughs> are the Finns, and they just mind their own business. I don't think Kimi and Valtteri say a word to each other no. at all. They just seem to avoid each other as well. I mean, I wonder what it's like in Finland in like a racing centre. Sometimes I think does anyone even talk? Um, but no, it's it's they do though they produce some of the greatest drivers in the world. So it was uh, it was interesting. We just need Mika Hakkinen to get in there, you yes. know, act as a referee group hug but no it is interesting you know we see chase there bernie eccleston turns up as well i mean for for bernie he's got his special job which means bringing people together you know he's obviously transferring his power to everybody and so it's an introduction that's going on almost like a lap of honor for for bernie at the moment because i think that i don't see him being there next year I, i think this is definitely his last year Handing it across, if you like, handing over the baton. So it, it's just funny, I, you know. Like you say you see you see Vladimir turn up in, with his cavalcade, and like you say, the conversation. I didn't get all the stuff about hotels, but it's funny you mentioned that. It's, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that really sort of sums up Russia. I think one thing which uh, is worth definitely mentioning that was news that broke on Sunday morning was that Sauber have signed a deal to run Honda engines for 2018, mm. which I think is a great idea for, for, for Honda. I mean, more engines on track, the better. Um, there's still a rumour going around that McLaren will run Mercedes engines next year. I'm not sure that's going to happen. And also, mm. just to emphasise why I don't think that's going to happen, is that Sauber today were reported that they're looking at getting the uh the drive shaft system yeah, that McLaren use yeah. to to basically to power their engine so to speak you know mm. so if what why would McLaren why would they want McLaren's unit if they're going to switch their engine manufacturer yeah I mean if McLaren do switch it won't be next year anyway no. I think I, I I think they'll commit to Honda for at least five years and then assess where they are I think that if, if things really don't improve I, I mean Honda do have the technology to turn it around uh, and, you know, this is an embarrassment right now. The president of Honda has been at several of the races this year, if not all of them, and they're aware of what they need to do. But, the, you know, there are times when you, like you say, you talk about all vibration affecting the car, all G-force affecting a car, fuel tank was the wrong shape. You know, you hear all these different things, and you think, well, we don't know what's causing the vibrations. You know, we don't... And you just think, with all the technology that they've got, yes, these engines are horrendously complex, but you know they they have the unlimited budget at Honda. It really is mm. hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and they should be able to figure out these issues before now. You know, there's really no excuse for them. So, uh, be interesting to see. But I think it'd be good for Salva because with last year's Ferrari engines, that's a waste of time. I don't think Formula One teams should be allowed to sell last year's engines. I think you sell this year's, or you mm. don't sell any. Yeah. But I think I think making grade two level teams of last year's technology is a waste of time. 
And I think Salford, they'll be lucky, lucky to score a point this year. I yep. mean, they they really are in a position where they just will never, ever be competitive again with the current setup. So, so they nothing to lose. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we leave Russia then with uh, Vettel on 86 points, 13 points clear of Hamilton in second with Bottas, now up to 63. Uh, and Raikkonen, we, I really want to see Kimi win a race. Yeah. You know, he needs to win a race, and, and doing it in Spain, I think, will be a good, good place to start. He does. You know, Kimi is number two driver for sure at Ferrari, but he's never really looked very dynamic with a car this year. At no point have I looked at him and thought, "Oh, that's a Kimi of old." You know, mm. m- you know, wrestling the car into a corner. In fact, I haven't seen Kimi of old for a long time. Yeah. Uh, really, I, I, I think we kind of saw it in 2012, uh, but. You know when he was driving for Lotus, yeah. but we haven't really seen much of that at Ferrari, and I don't know. He just cruises round and you know seems well, to do his own thing. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Kimi Raikkonen, he always has and has always excelled when the focus is not on him. Mm. When he's in an underdog team, I mean, even when he won the championship in two thousand seven. All eyes were on Hamilton, Alonso, and McLaren. Right. You know they were they were had to win, surely. And then he comes in and he almost looks surprised that he won the championship yeah. on the podium. You know exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's very strange, isn't it? I mean, he never seems that motivated. No. Uh, but when he's in the car, you know, he's still solid. And there he is, and he's fourth in the championship. But you know, things can all change. Two wins yep. back to back, and suddenly he's right back there. You Absolutely. know, vying for the lead of the championship. So, you know, you can never write anyone off at this stage. Yeah. I think looking at the championship so far, we've had these faster cars this year. But, you know, when we were at Australia, everyone was saying, oh, look how much faster the cars are. You know, two seconds, four seconds, five seconds. Now we're down to one second faster yeah. than last year. You wonder what's happening with the pace of development. What, what's gone wrong? I think Russia was is an anomaly anyway because there is no tyre degradation at the track. So tracks where you need that, you know, where the, where the tracks are more grippier surface... And you know the 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 bigger, thicker tires and the mm. more power, you're going to see a, a a greater difference. Interesting, because you know, I mean, with extra mechanical grip and extra power, they should be quicker everywhere. And I, you know, yeah. even when we look at different attributes, we should still say, well, actually, they should be much quicker than last year. So mm. I found it quite curious. Even in Bahrain, this conversation came up. They're actually slower than last year at times. So very unusual how the cars have performed this year. The cars are clearly behind on development. We've got almost a new Red Bull coming in Spain in a couple of weeks time. Apparently a new Force India is on the way. Essentially they're using upgraded version of last year's car. So right now they're treading water into the new car or parts arrive uh, that are significant. Wow, I look forward to that because mm. they're really going to consolidate their position. But besides that, you know, it's just going to be interesting to see how the pace of development pans out you know it's really going to be a development race throughout the next few months uh, and it'll be interesting to see how ferrari evolve bearing in mind this is a james allison car and james allison no longer works at ferrari so mm. that'll be now he's going to red bull is not uh, no he's going no, to no, he's, mercedes he's sorry technical director he's already there he's, he's already there at mercedes director. now so you know it's going to be he's competing against his own invention yeah. but he, you know in that sense he knows the strengths and weaknesses yeah. and one of the weaknesses is supposed to be on the mercedes that it's not great at following other cars yeah. uh, so you know generally speaking they haven't had to really it's just one of those things so it'll be, be, be interesting to see how the championship pans out we've still got quite a few drivers that haven't got a point there pascal verline of course lance stroll you know but uh Palmer needs to get something somewhere but you know seeing Fernando Alonso no points oh, you know I know Sad. it's so frustrating but it's one of those things and also one thing to take note of in Spain in a couple of weeks will be the start of the American influence from Liberty Media the requirement in the sporting regulations has gone in that all cars must show somewhere on the car will be the number of the driver and the name of the person that's driving that car. Mm. So people are already coming up with ideas. What I think the most popular one is going to be uh, a number on a side pod with the name underneath. But uh, whether it appears in the rear wing or what have you, whatever everybody does, mm. I think it's going to be great to see. Um, actually, you, you won't need to res- remember all the no. race helmets. Well, it, you know. will, it will help. I mean, the big problem with race helmets was it actually was easier in the past because when a driver got... A driver had one helmet for their whole career. Yeah. Okay, so if it was Damon Hill or if it was uh, Nigel Mansell or Ayrton Senna, they had one helmet. That was it from the beginning to the end of their career. And you could see those helmets very clearly. They were usually 
pretty defined in the car. Nowadays, they change their helmets every season. And even I forget who's who. I couldn't tell you sometimes when a Red Bull's coming by who's who. Yes, you might know which color the T-bar is on the top. But generally speaking, we always used it defined by helmet. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, I think it always helps, for, especially for the crowd. Yeah. Uh, because they don't know the, the color of every driver's helmet sometimes. Especially, you might go to the Grand Prix and they haven't told you, but they've changed the color of the helmet that morning or something yeah. like that. You know, especially I mean, in Monaco, you tend to get that in particular. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a good rule. And like you say, anything that kind of opens it up to more fans is, is a good thing. Uh, one thing is we did lose, a, you know, whenever we lose cars at the beginning of a race now, though, you really do see it really reduces the number so much. Mm -hmm. You know, you're immediately starting with 17 cars yeah. at this race, pretty much, you know, after yeah. the first lap. And, you know, that's one thing we really do want to get back up to at least 24, 26 yeah. cars on the grid because it makes such a huge difference to the racing. So I do look forward to the changes that Liberty Media bring in. In that sense, it's very exciting and it's great to see the video clips on Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that really opening up the sport. So it's been an exciting first part of the season. I really look forward to uh, uh, Spain. Uh, Tim, what are your expectations for the Spanish Grand Prix? Spanish Grand Prix every season has always been a bit of a reset hasn't it really you, you kind of hope and expect that uh, teams have done with the flyaways the european starts and the heart of the formula one season comes in spain this year you know i expect ferrari and mercedes still be leading the pack i hope and i, and I do expect red bull to close slightly and the top three engines Ferrari, Mercedes and Renault are now deemed to be within 0.3 seconds of each other. Something which Christian Horner is uh, saying that's not quite true. And I think if Sochi's got anything to go by, that's not true. But they've apparently put together this calculation that they're all going to be within 0.3 around the Barcelona track. Well, we'll find out, won't we? In, in a couple of weeks, whether that's actually accurate or not. So there was an expectation that we will have Red Bull up there with 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 the other two uh, leaders at the moment. All eyes, I sadly, I don't think we'll see any difference from, from McLaren. I think they're going to be rooted to the back of the grid, really. Mm. And I think uh, they're going to be struggling to get any higher than, than the Salvas, even, possibly. Exactly. Fernando Alonso's home Grand Prix... Uh, you know he's going to want to do there. Sadly, uh, he may be getting a flight away from the circuit earlier and focusing on his Indy 500. I'm sure that's where his mind already is. He knows he's not going to win it this year. And he would so love to win it for the crowd because yeah. the crowd do love him. Let's just hope that McLaren can actually finish the race. That would be enough, I think, yeah. for the crowd is just to see him driving round, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, just to get one point, I think, would be like winning. Well, listen, Tim, thanks for your time today. Uh, we look forward to the Spanish Grand Prix, of course, in a couple of weeks' time. And then we'll be getting more into the rhythm on our blogs, getting them up on time. So it's a bit late on this one, but we caught up with Sochi. Just a quick one this week, of course. And uh, that's it from me for now. As ever, there'll be more from us very soon. Thank you.